The Bomb by Somerset Mom. God knows how often I had lamented that I had not half the time I needed to do half the things I wanted. I could not remember when last I had the moment to myself. I had often amused my fancy with the prospect of just one week's complete idleness. Most of us, when not busy working, are busy playing. We ride, play tennis or golf, swim or gamble. But I saw myself doing nothing at all. I would lounge through the morning, dawdle through the afternoon, and loaf through the evening. My mind would be a slate, and each passing hour a sponge that wiped out scribblings written on it by the world of sense. Time, because it is so fleeting. Time, because it is beyond recall, is the most precious of human goods. And to squander it is the most delicate form of dissipation in which man can indulge. Cleopatra dissolved in wine a precious pearl, but she gave it to Antony to drink. When you waste the brief golden hours, you take the breaker, in which the jam is melted and dash its contents to the ground. The gesture is grand, and like all grand gestures, absurd. That, of course, is its excuse. In a week, I promised myself I should naturally read. For the habitual reader, reading is a drug of which he is a slave. Deprive him of printed matter, and he grows nervous, moody and restless. Then, like the alcoholic bereft of brandy, who will drink the shellac or methylated spirit, he will make do with the advertisements of a paper five years old. He will make do with a telephone directory. But the professional writer is seldom a disinterested reader. I wish my reading to be but another form of idleness. I made up my mind that if ever the happy day arrived when I could enjoy untroubled leisure, I would complete the enterprise that always tempted me, but which hitherto, like an explorer making reconnaissances into an undiscovered country, I had done little more than enter upon. I would read the entire works of Nick Carter, but I had always fancied myself in choosing a moment with surroundings to my liking. Not having it forced upon me, and when I was suddenly faced with nothing to do, and, and had to make the best of it, like a steamship acquaintance, whom in the wide waste of the Pacific Ocean you have invited to stay with you in London, and who turns up without warning and with all his luggage, I was not a little taken aback. I had come to Veracruz from Mexico City to catch one of the Ward Company's white cool ships to Yucatan. And found to my dismay that a dock strike having been declared overnight, my ship would not be put in. I was stuck in Veracruz. I took a room in the Hotel del Gentius, overlooking the plaza, and spent the morning looking at the sights of the town. I wandered down the side streets and peeped into quaint courts. I sauntered through the parish church. It is picturesque with its gargoyles and flying buttresses. And the salt wind and the blazing sun have painted its harsh and massive walls with the mellowness of age. Its cupola is covered with white and blue tiles. Then I found that I had seen all that was to be seen, and I sat down in the coolness of the arcade that surrounded the square and ordered a drink. The sun beat down on the plaza with a merciless splendor. The cocoa palms drooped dustily and bedraggled. The great black buzzards perched on them for a moment uneasily. Soup to the ground to gather some bit of offal, and then, with lumbering wings, flew up to the church tower. I watched the people crossing the square: Negroes, Indians, Creoles, and Spanish. The motley people of the Spanish Main, and they varied in color from ebony to ivory. As the morning wore on, the tables around me filled up, chiefly with men who had come to have a drink before luncheon, for the most part in white ducks. But some, notwithstanding the heat and dark clothes of professional respectability, a small band, a guitarist, a blind fiddler, and a harpist played ragtime. After every other tune, the guitarist came round with a plate. I had already bought the local paper, and I was adamant to the newsvendors who pertinaciously sought to sell me more copies of the same sheet. I refused, oh, twenty times at least. The solicitations of grimy urchins who wanted to shine my spotless shoes, and having come to the end of my small change, I could only shake my head at the beggars who importuned me. They gave no one peace. Little Indian women in shapeless rags, each one with a baby tied in a shawl on her back, held out skinny hands and in a whimper recited a dismal screed. Blind men were led up to my table by small boys. The maimed, the halt, the deformed exhibited sores and the monstrosities in which nature or accident had afflicted them, and half-naked, underfed children whined endlessly for the demand for coppers. 
but these kept their eyes open for the fat policeman who would suddenly dart out on them with a throng and give them a sharp cut on the back or over the head when they would scamper only to return again when exhausted by the exercise of so much energy he relapsed into lethargy but suddenly my attention was attracted by a beggar unlike the rest of them and indeed the people sitting around me swarthy and black-haired had hair and beard of a red so visit it was startling his beard was ragged and long mop of hair looked as though it had been not been brushed for months he wore only a pair of trousers and a cotton singlet but they were tatters grimy and foul that had barely held together i had never seen anyone so thin his legs his naked arms were but skin and bone and though the rents of his singlet you saw every rib of his wasted body could count the bones of his dusty covered feet of that starveling band he was easily the most abject he was not old he could not well have been more than 40 and i could not but ask myself what had brought him to this pass it was absurd to think that he would not have worked if work he had not been able to get he was the only one of the beggars who did not speak the rest of them poured forth their litany of woe and if it did nothing to bring alms the ass continued until an impatient word from you chased them away he said nothing i suppose he felt his look of destitution was all the appeal he needed he did not even hold out his hand he merely looked at you but with such wretchedness in his eyes such despair in his attitude it was dreadful he stood on and on silent and immobile gazing steadfastly and then If he took no notice of him he moved slowly to the next table if he was given nothing he showed neither disappointment or anger if someone had offered him a coin he stepped towards a little stretched out his claw like hand took it without a word of thanks and impassively went his way i had nothing to give him and when he came to me so that i should not wait in vain i shook my head dispense to start por dios i said using the polite castilian formula with which the spaniards refuse a beggar but he paid no attention to what i said he stood in front of me for as long as he stood at the other tables looking at me with tragic eyes i have never seen such a wreck of humanity there was something terrifying in his appearance he did not look quite sane at length he passed on it was one o'clock and i had lunch when i awoke from my siesta it was still very hot but towards the evening a breath of air coming in through the windows which i had last ventured to open tempted me into the plaza i sat down under my arcade in the open space from the surrounding streets tables in the restaurants round filled up and the kiosk in the middle of the band began to play the crowd grew thicker on the free benches people sat huddled together like dark grapes clustered in a stalk there was a lively hum of conversation The big black buzzards flew screeching overhead swooping down when they saw something to pick up or scurrying away from under the feet of the passers-by as a twilight descended they swarmed it seen from all parts of the town towards the church tower they circled heavily about it and coarsely crying squabbling and jangling settled themselves uneasily to roost and again boot blacks begged me to have my shoes cleaned Newsboys press dark papers upon me beggars whine their plaintive demand for alms I saw once more that strange red-bearded fellow and watched him stand motionless with a crushed and piteous air before one table after another he did not stop before mine I suppose he remembered me from the morning and had failed to get anything from me when he thought useless to try again You do not often see a red-haired Mexican and because it was only in Russia that I had seen men so destitute I mean I asked myself if he was by chance a Russian it accorded me well enough with the Russian frecklessness that he should have allowed himself to sink to such a depth of degradation yet he had not a Russian face his emaciated features were clear cut and his blue eyes were not set in the head of a Russian manner I wondered if he could be a sailor English Scandinavian or American who had deserted his ship and by degrees sunk into his pitiful condition he disappeared since there was nothing else to do i stayed on till i got hungry and when i had eaten came back i sat on till the thinning crowd suggested it was bedtime i confessed that the day had seemed long and i had wondered why many similar days i should be forced to spend there but i woke after a little while and i could not get to sleep again my room was stifling i opened the shutters and looked out at the church There was no moon, but the bright stars faintly lit its outline. The buzzards were closely packed on the cross above the cupola and on the edges of the tower, and now and then they moved a little. 
The effect was uncanny. And then, I have no notion why, that red scarecrow recurred in my mind, and I had suddenly the strange feeling that I had seen him before. It was so vivid that it drove me away to the possibility of sleep. I felt sure that I had come across him, but when and where I could not tell. I tried to picture the surroundings in which he might take his place, but I could see no more than a dim figure against the background of fog. As the dawn approached, it grew cooler, and I was able to sleep. I spent my second day at Veracruz, I had spent my first, but I watched for the coming of the red-haired beggar, and as he stood at the tables near mine, I examined him with attention. I felt certain now that I had seen him somewhere. I even felt certain that I had known him and talked to him, but I still could recall none of the circumstances. Once more he passed my table without stopping, and when his eyes met mine, I looked in them for some gleam of recollection. Nothing. I wondered if I had made a mistake and thought I had seen him the same way as sometimes, by some queer motion of the brain. In the act of doing something, you are convinced that you are repeating in the action you have done at some past time. I could not get out of my head the impression that in some moment he had entered into my life. I racked my brains. I was sure now he was either English or American, but I was shy in addressing him. I went over in my mind the possible occasions when I might have met him. Not to be able to place him exasperated me as it does when you try to remember the name that is on the tip of your tongue and it eludes you. The day wore on. Another day came, another morning, another evening. It was Sunday and the plaza was more crowded than ever. The tables under the arcade were packed. As usual, the red-haired beggar came along, a terrifying figure in his silence, his threadbare rags and his pitiful distress. He was standing in front of a table only two from mine, beseeching, but without a gesture. Then I saw the policeman who would at intervals try to protect the public from the impunities of all these beggars sneak around a column and give him a resounding whack with his thong. His thin body winced, but he made no protest and showed no resentment. He seemed to accept the stinging blow, as in the ordinary course of things and with his slow movements slunk away into the gathering night of the plaza. But the cruel stripe had whipped my memory and suddenly I remembered. Not his name! That escaped me still, but everything else. He must have recognized me, for I had not changed very much in twenty years. And that was why that first morning he had never paused in front of my table. Yes, it was twenty years since I had known him. I was spending a winter in Rome, and every evening I used to dine in a restaurant in the Via Sistina, where you got excellent macaroni and a good bottle of wine. It was frequented by a little band of English and American art students and one or two writers, and we used to stay late into the night, engaged in intermittable arguments upon art and literature. He used to come in with a young painter who was a friend of his. He was only a boy then, he could not have been more than twenty-two, and with his blue eyes, straight nose, and red hair, he was pleasing to look at. I remember that he had spoke a great deal of Central America. He had a job with the American Fruit Company, but had thrown it over because he wanted to be a writer. He was not popular among us because he was arrogant, and we were none of us old enough to take arrogance of youth with tolerance. He thought of us poor fish and did not hesitate to tell us so, who would not show us his work, because our praise meant nothing to him, and he despised our censure. His vanity was enormous. It irritated us, but some of us were uneasily aware that it might perhaps be justified. Was it possible that the intense consciousness of genius that he had rested on no grounds? He had sacrificed everything to be a writer. He was so certain of himself that he infected some of his friends with his own assurance. I recalled his high spirits, his vitality, his confidence in the future, and his disinterestedness. It was impossible that he was the same man. And yet I was sure of it. I, st I stood up, paid for my drink, and went out to the plaza to find him. My thoughts were in turmoil. I was aghast. I had thought of him now, and then idly wondered what had become of him. I could never have imagined that he was reduced to his frightful misery. There are hundreds, thousands of youths who enter upon the hard calling of the arts with extravagant hopes. But for the most part, they come to terms with their mediocrity and find somewhere in life a niche where they can escape starvation. This was awful. I asked myself what had happened. 
What hopes deferred had broken his spirit? What disappointments shattered him? And what lost illusions ground him to the dust? I asked myself if nothing could be done. I walked around the plaza. He was not in the arcades. There was no hope finding him in the crowd that circled round the bandstand. The light was waning and I was afraid I had lost him. Then I passed the church and saw him sitting on the steps. I cannot describe what a lamentable object he looked. Life had taken him, rent him on its racks, torn him limb from limb, and then flung him a bleeding wreck on the stone steps of that church. I went up to him. Do you remember Rome, I said? He did not move. He did not answer. He took no more notice of me than if I was not standing before him. He did not look at me. His vacant blue eyes rested on the buzzards that were screaming and tearing at some object at the bottom of the steps. I did not know what to do. I took a Leo black note out of my pocket and pressed it in his hand. He did not give a glance, but his hand moved a little. The thin claw-like fingers closed on the note and scrunched it up. He made it into a ball and then edging it to his thumb flicked it into the air so that it fell among the jangling buzzards. I turned my head instinctively and saw one of them seize it with the beak and fly off, followed by two others screaming behind it. When I looked back, the man was gone. I stayed three more days in Veracruz. I never saw him again.